Good evening, everyone. Time is 6 o'clock. Time to order our briefing session for February the 15th, 2022. Thank you very much for your attendance and being present here. Uh, let me cover something very quickly in terms of um, housekeeping. The uh, champion of the city that I've been doing regularly for a couple of years now, uh, the individual coming for tonight is an adjunct professor, and he has an online business course that he teaches that starts at 7 o'clock. And so he has agreed to be here for me to recognize him as a champion of the city, and then he's got a book. So what our responsibility is, we have got to be out there and ready to go at 7 o'clock so I can take care of that. And so what I would like to do, with your understanding, is take that champion of the city to right after the pledges, uh, the invocation and the pledges, so that that individual can get to his class. Is that acceptable to everybody? Sure. Okay, good. I told him we would do everything possible to let him get to class. Yeah, do you have a comment? Uh, not related to that. Oh. When, when, I, when you have a second, I, I, will, I have a comment. Go Housekeeping ahead. comment? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, it seems as though, and this may just be me, but in my opinion, it seems as though we've kind of gotten away from doing our our calendars in this room. We we're all here together, and we can discuss all of the issues that are coming ahead. So maybe it was a COVID thing, but we got we kind of scatter shoot online through emails and whatnot, and it seems like we don't get things in order the way that we should, in my opinion. And it seems like doing doing our calendars in here. Every once in a while, there's going to be something that comes up that's unavoidable that we have to do by email. But it just seems like we've gotten away from that in here. Am I wrong in that observation? Calendar, well, the city secretary has been putting the calendar as an actual item that we discussed during briefing session. Is it on? I didn't see it on tonight. It's not on tonight. So we can get it back on. Okay. Well, that's all I'm looking yeah. for because it just seems like it's, it's smoother to get everything that's coming down the road for a couple of weeks on, on while well, we're all here. That way we don't have to try Which to... Which calendars are you talking about? I'm talking about all, all of our... The city calendar. Events, the city calendar. Yeah. We, we don't do events on those two. No, I'm talking about any upcoming meetings, special meetings. Anything uh, that involves the council. Meetings, yeah. Just so that we can coordinate oh. our schedules rather than doing it via email where we're not together. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, so, oh, uh, one other point. Uh, Mr. Hager has a, uh, in lieu of attorney with us tonight, Hunter Maddox. Hey, nice Hello. to see you all. Mr. Maddox, welcome. Thank you very much for, for being here and being our city attorney for the night. All right, moving on to our briefing session. We will go to first thing is to discuss the agenda items. City Manager, Ms. Farrell Benavides, please. Uh, Mayor and Council, we have one item on the consent agenda, uh, and these are considerations of minutes. Uh, the minutes for October 19th, 2021, uh, December 7th, 2021, uh, December 21st, 2021, January 18th, 2022, and January 24th, the special meeting, uh, 2022. That is all on the consent agenda. Okay. Uh, question on the consent agenda for the uh, for the uh, council in minutes. Are we taking a second look at those to making sure they are correct and accurate? And any uh, and I didn't find any. We want to make sure we're not they're correct and accurate. We have any typos that may be there being corrected. But what actions are we taking to make sure that is uh, taken care of? They're written, they're proofread, and they're gone through Grammarly, and then they're uploaded for y'all to verify and add if y'all want changes. And I read every one and every word and every one. All right. And if I find anything, she knows. Very good. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. McBurnett, please. Uh, in, in, re in reviewing the agenda, I was looking at item 5D. And I, I guess maybe my question is for the city manager, because we've had this discussion before. Is, is there any change? I haven't seen any change. Is there any change to this agreement that we originally discussed and or is there any money uh, or funds change as well? As well? 
Okay. Uh, this is actually an updated agreement. Uh, the only updates to the agreement are per our discussion. Dallas has taken on the additional sign or signal in which they ask us to do. They will handle all costs supported with it as well as construction for this. And so it's an updated agreement to include the additional signal for da the city of Dallas. There's no change uh, from a management standpoint for our city. So with that said, Mayor, I would like to move that to the consent agenda as well. I would agree with that. We've been, this was a major item for us and it was resolved to the city's satisfaction with the big, really big help from uh, city manager and from uh, Mr. Ramey. Uh, and I did read the memos that were going back and forth. Very clear, very simple. We're not doing this. So thank you very much for okay. enacting it. Yes, so we will move item 5D uh, to consent. Not just, making a note. This is an update I was going to provide tonight. Is they, The Dallas City Council did approve that on their side uh, on the 9th. So as soon as we approve it, it will be, you know, gone. so I just want to make sure you, you knew that. I was looking for you. I didn't. There you are. <laughs> when I said Mr. Ring, I didn't. There you are. Yeah, I know. Okay. Very good. All right. Moving on to item two. Uh, briefings presentations discuss upcoming improvements to Armstrong Park in the 2018 Parks Bond election. Mr. Stevenson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, we are finally on um, what we believe to be the backstretch of getting the construction of Armstrong Park uh, underway very soon. We've been on this backstretch for about a year and a half. That's primarily due to some things I'll talk about here in a second. But just to give you a quick overview of timeline of where this project started and where we are today. In 2017, we completed the park master plan. That's where we first started talking about kind of reimagining what Kidsville could look like. In 2018, uh, we took a, a bond proposition to the voters and they approved bond funds for the uh, renovation or replacement of Kidsville as well as any splash pad here in Armstrong Park. In 2019, we began design of what those would look like. We also submitted those design plans as well as an application to Texas Parks and Wildlife for a grant. And in 2020, we received work from Texas Parks and Wildlife that we had received that grant. That was about mid-year. mid, mid -year. Um, Towards the end of the year, we were anticipated finding out when we could begin the process of procurement and getting, pro getting the project underway. Well, at that time, we found out that our project was being funded through um, federal funds through the National Park Service. And so there was an agreement that had to take place between Texas Parks and Wildlife and the National Park Service in order for us to move forward. Well, early 2020, that paperwork has still not been completed. So the first response I got back from Texas Parks and Wildlife, well, there's been a change in administration at the federal level, and so there's been a delay. And so a year and a half after that, we finally, two weeks ago, received official word from Texas Parks and Wildlife that we can move forward with the procurement of Armstrong Park. So we're excited about that. So what I want the opportunity to take the opportunity to do today is uh, refresh everyone's memories about what we're designing, what we're building, because uh, it's been a long process. And for some of you on the council, you haven't been involved in that process. So I want to make sure that you're aware of what, what's coming and what we're doing, uh, what we're going to be providing for our citizens here uh, in the next, hopefully, uh, 8 to 12 months. So I brought with me uh, Adam Brewster. He is with Dunaway & Associates. He's going to walk you through our design presentation. I also want to note that we have been working closely with the park board through this entire process. Um, we've also been discussing over this time how we can preserve some of the memories or the um, the essence of the current Kidsville, and we've been looking at doing some of those things, uh, maintaining the spires, do some creative elements with that, do some type of uh, a message board or a picture board with uh, some information about the original Kidsville back in 1989. It was a huge undertaking by this community. At the time when that was built, it was the largest leathers wooden playground in the United States. That's a big deal. So we want to preserve that history and let people know about it. We're also going to talk about me making some of the wood available to some of the original uh, builders. Um, they talked to us about uh, wanting to make picture frames out of that wood and provide it to their family members who provided the, the labor to help build it back in 1989. So we'll be doing that as well. So we're all thinking about those issues as well. But our main uh, focus here today is to refresh everyone's memory about what's coming, what it's going to look like, and we're excited to finally get here. So. Thanks, Mark. 
Mayor and Council, we really appreciate the opportunity to be here for you. Again, I'm Adam Brewster with Dunaway Associates, and Dunaway has been involved in this project since 2017 and has uh, been involved in the park master plan and, uh, and seeing um, that initial uh, progress in the planning stages and making this a project. So we've been excited to kind of see it through this far. I know it's been hard, but I commend uh, Bart and Timothy and the staff at the city for sticking with it and seeing it through and it's really a, a great opportunity and a really a legacy park that we think um, is due for an update and the voters did as well as they all voted to uh, add these improvements over the years. Um, what you see on the screen is a site plan of what was determined to be phase one of the Armstrong Park renovation uh, to orient you. Uh, we're down here in the city city hall, the senior center where we hosted many of the public meetings, just at the top of the drawing. Uh, the blue pavilion there, with, where uh, performances and uh, your Fourth of July celebration happen, is there. Uh, in this area, that is currently where the Kidsville stands today. <coughs> we thought it best to relocate it in the same location, um, and through the plan master planning process and uh, working with the uh, city input and um, citizen input. We identified the need for a spray ground and that that would be a, a nearby adjacent to the playground, but enough distance to keep those uses separated uh, for operational issues. You also notice there's some other structures like the group shelter, existing storage building and restroom that are gonna remain in place. We've designed around them uh, we've also designed around many of the existing trees and try to preserve those because a lot of those went in with the first um, construction of the playground and now that they've matured they really give some neat environment we want to we want to uh, parlay that into uh, the new design um, as we discussed when we first came back and had our public meetings we showed a lot of different new and modern playgrounds and different styles and different manufacturers that were available and the community continued to talk about their love for the uh, playground that's out there they love you know there's some, a lot of sentimentality around it and what we were asked to do is go out and find who did that we knew that that was uh, the leathers associates so leathers associates uh, builds playgrounds around uh, the nation and oftentimes those are community built but they also can build them um, themselves and provide those uh, they have done some updates to their equipment um, what you'll notice in the new leathers playgrounds is that it's uh, synthetic wood so you have resin instead of wood so you're going to see reduced you know splintering and um, more longevity out of it but you'll also notice some of the similar um, features that you are very familiar with with it being all constructed on site with dimensional lumber and uh, a lot of the uh, spires and towers and the imagination that went into the first leathers playground is the same people that are going to be uh, designing or did design and will provide this so this is just some of their newer equipment um, again this kidney bean shape is where the playground is uh, we've divided it into three spaces um, these uh, speckled colors here in the middle are going to be um, poured in place surfacing. So that's going to be uh, a resilient rubber surfacing that will make this facility uh, fully accessible. So every um, transfer station or access point on the large pavilion or large playground and on the toddler playground is accessible. Uh, you also notice the top lot. We've, we kind of separate. Uh, typically in playground design we separate the two to five year olds and the five to twelve year olds so that they can uh, there's fewer conflicts between them and the, the playability is different between them as well uh, with the top lot um, we'd like to uh, enclose that area so you're not going to have toddlers running off so it's going to have a small fence around that area and then the signature structure this is going to be the one that's going to hold back um, some of those large spires and um, towers that you have uh, as well as uh, rope climbers, slides, and uh, other elements. Uh, the third area is the open play space. You can see we've arranged uh, three different bays of swings 
um, all different types. Uh, so you've got your standard belt swings. You've got um, kind of toddler swings that are going to have the um, uh, younger um, chairs. And then you've got these um, these platform swings that kids can sit on and swing. It's kind of like a tire swing, except su supported on two sides. So multiple people can get on it at the same time. So that's the overview of the playground. Uh, our next image, this is provided by Leathers. Again, these are the same people that uh, designed the, and built the, the current one. They looked at that and uh, it was brought up in many meetings that we wanted to have the, the spires. We wanted to have those high pitched roofs and also the, the um, that a lot of people are using this, you know, as an imagination and kind of in, interpreting the playground as different features. Uh, some of the, you know, out there, the town elements with uh, uh, cars and airplanes and things are involved. In here, you have boats, um, trains, so you have some of that same kind of transportation themed elements within it. Uh, you also notice. This will be the entrance into it. Just through the entrance, there's an opportunity to put another one of those spires. As Bart mentioned, there may be some creative opportunity to um, salvage some of the other spires and uh, maybe include them at the entry area as well, where you're going to also have the plaque will be located in this area. You can see that fence around the space. What they don't illustrate is the play surfacing, but uh, it, it will all be um, like I mentioned, fully accessible with resilient rubber surfacing to all of the transfer stations. So this brings us back to the site plan. That's an overview of that. I also want to point out in the public meetings, there was a request to have some quiet space and some spaces for uh, teenagers to utilize the park as well. Uh, we incorporated a study grove in the existing trees. So you're going to see some hammock. Um, posts that, that can and uh, some picnic stations so maybe the uh, teenagers could enjoy that space uh, but some of the features you see out there um, sorry uh, on this will be a main gathering area where your entrance will come in this way there are secondary entrances from other uh, other directions as well but these yellow uh, squares you see there will be uh, fabric shade structures and similar to these square um, structures you see here. Uh, the existing pavilion will undergo um, some upgrades, mainly uh, architectural upgrades of stone on the columns to enhance the look of that as well as some grill space. Uh, picnic stations, there's going to be a variety of different um, tables out there, uh, including the larger accessible tables, but then you're going to have some smaller um, square tables that'll be around the uh, study grove and the uh, the spray ground area and this is what we kind of imagined here at the study grove that a lot of folks are using hammocks and tying them off in parks just to trees and to different spaces and we're going to provide an opportunity for that along with the seating uh, uh, tables for maybe doing homework or uh, getting together after school now that brings us over to the other uh, main element of the park which is the spray ground and you can see here, it's got a, a curvilinear shape. Um, within that shape, you'll see uh, some patterning uh, uh, reminiscent of waves that you may see on, on an ocean beach or lake beach, uh, defining the two edges kind of uh, bracketed uh, by uh, low seat walls where you can sit. You can throw your towel before you go out and play in that. That's, we, we find that these low seat walls are really where people get you know, call home base when they put their shoes and things on that and claim a little piece of real estate before they go into it. Um, there will be an additional shade fabric. Uh, these will be um, hexagonal umbrellas that are going to be over the um, picnic tables, but also over in the spray ground and incorporated into the spray ground as well. Uh, you'll see in the in the look and feel there's some um, imagery of uh, water elements, but it's it's uh, it's subtle, it's not an overpowering, heavily themed spray ground. You'll see we have some images, but this is uh, the equipment that um, manufacturer um, Water Odyssey that is also going to be used here. So this is a spray ground in Dallas, not, not too far from here, but you'll see some of this style and this quality equipment on your, your spray ground as well. We did a quick uh, perspective to show you that, but 
just like that orange bucket you saw there, there will be a different bucket here that will provide that uh, high intense, uh, high spray activity kind of in that corner of the site. As you go <coughs> towards the beach, you have these lower bubblers that are more geared towards the toddler where the, the parents can kind of enjoy and sit under the shade and, and watch them. And there's themed elements throughout there. Uh, so that is an overview of the spray ground and the playground and like I said we appreciate having an opportunity to work on this for the last uh, several years <laughs> and I'm really glad that um, that the funding from the uh, grant came through and we, we were looking forward to seeing this constructed and I really think it's going to be uh, a nice addition to the park and we'd love to answer any questions you may have. Uh, just some comments Mr. Brewster that through all of this, these iterations, I'm looking at the original concept plan. In this brain, all I had planted was the fort and the splash spray ground. And now seeing that this concept has actually enlarged to include the other amenities that we saw in the original plan, I, I thought those were going to come in after years. But now seeing that they've been incorporated, like the hammocks and, and the quiet place, and so on that these are now incorporated plus the top I thought the top was going to be something different coming in a later date seeing all of this is now coming into play I think is I'm extremely pleased to be able to see that to say that it incorporates much more than what we that I had envisioned in terms of the original presentations that some of the things that probably were looking for the out years after the fort and the splash pad are now here so I'm extremely pleased to see that uh, one quick question, uh, Mr. Stevenson, is that, so the $750,000 that we got in the grant, how much of the bond money has to be put toward this total completion? By the, by the letter of the grant, we have to match the $750,000. So we have to spend at least $750,000, which we're doing more than that. So what we'll be doing is we'll just be using the $750,000 grant money in, in place of the bond money we originally pledged. And then with that, we'll use that for other parts of this project or other projects that we decide at a later date. So if we take this total concept, what's the what's the total, the net net number on the total concept, knowing that there's 750 and 750 in there? What's the, the total? Well, our, our, our budget on this project originally was 2.25 million. Okay. There so you. we have 750,000 being provided by the grant. And the rest will be provided by the by There the you go. That's, that's okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, questions. Yes, uh, material. Uh, and also, we're kind of being pushed back a little bit. Did you see any challenges with material coming in to finish up the project uh, in a okay. timely manner? And then you can also, while, while you're there, talk about how you're doing on the time, how would you do on the timeline? Okay. We, we're, um, we estimate there will be about six to eight month construction period. Um, the material that's been the longest lead item that we have been fighting and working with the manufacturers on um, has been the resin wood because the resin market, I know lumber has been going like crazy, but resin has really gone nuts and changed. Um, so we've been working with leathers and they've been, they've already uh, identified and the resin from their providers and earmarked it so they will have it available to do the, the construction. Um, so that has been a big challenge. So we're seeing that. Um, but the, the Water Odyssey on the spray ground equipment, uh, what's unique about them is they're actually uh, manufactured in Texas. So in Marble Falls, I believe, is where their uh, manufacturing is. And so uh, you don't run into those items that are coming from overseas or getting stuck in a port somewhere. So on the spray ground element, that would be the case. Uh, there's always opportunity and, you know, there's opportunity for things to get screwed up along the way, but we've worked cl as closely as possible with the manufacturers and the uh, vendors of the material to. And would you remind, would you remind us again about the, the spray? I know there's one city that had to, the spray issue in their city. Would you remind us how we, how you've addressed that already in this particular project? Okay. I think something about the contamination. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Um, so, the main um, element you hear about is cryptosporidium, and that's a, a bacteria that can, uh, can grow in water. Uh, since 
it's it's been quite some time now, but uh, probably about 2005, there was a, uh, the health codes were upgraded to require uh, secondary sanitation. So previously, they used to only be chlorine, similar to a pool water that would be used. Uh, but by adding a secondary form of sanitation, which is ultraviolet light, uh, which kills cryptosporidium, has been added to, um, to, as a requirement, to all spray ground construction and will be in this project as well. But basically, ultraviolet light is a super bright light, and 100% of the water that goes out to the spray ground has to go through that light before it can make it onto, this, um, onto the spray bed. So previously, constructed before 2005, you wouldn't have seen uh, that secondary form of sanitation, and that was the genesis of much of the issues you maybe have, have seen with other cities. You, you talk, go ahead, Mark. Well, no, recently there was also an issue here in DFW with the, I think the brain eating amoeba, I think is what it was. Yeah, it was the a, issue there was related to a lack of maintenance. And they had an older system that didn't have automatic chemical controls. And so their staff was required to go out there daily to check chemicals and make sure those were up to date. They weren't doing that. So our system and all the newer systems do have a chem control system that will automatically do the chemicals for us. Our staff will still be out there daily checking to make sure things are right. But we will have an, also have an automatic system that will help, help us alleviate that type of issue. Talk a little bit more about, about the, the, the water itself. I know we had people thinking that the water it will be recycled in the water. OK. Um, so the way this works is essentially functions just like a pool. Uh, the, the filtration is exactly what you would have in a pool, except rather than the water being on the surface, it's contained in an underground vault. And that is where it uh, is stored. So when it's sprayed and it goes in the drain, it doesn't go off to the creek somewhere. It goes back into that. Uh, that reservoir and is pumped again. So once you fill it, you have to top off the water a little bit every day, but you're not filling a pool every day and you're not wasting a lot of water. So it's a, it's a re reclamation system. And then last question, Mark. Will there be a drawing up for citizens to see the, as they go through this eight months, what it's going to look like? Is there a drawing placed up by the park? I believe it's on our bond website, but we got to make sure it's there. I'm pretty confident that all this, design, all this design stuff is out there on the website. On the website. I'm saying actually the park itself. Oh, yeah. There'll be a sign, yes. In fact, be, that's required. Drawing, a drawing. They'll be required. We, we can put a drawing out there as well. Okay. Um, there'll be a sign out there announcing this is a bond project and you're bond all the work and all the things that you typically see at a bond project. Okay. I'll look more so for the drawing where people can see it, get a, a picture of how it's going to look yes. when they complete it. So. Okay. Thank you. Yes, yes. Yeah, Mr. Contreras. Uh, just quickly, um, with the with the expansion, uh, including the, the splash park, are there going to be trees that are going to have to be removed and so are they going to be replaced? So we did, yes, uh, we did the plan a while ago. I don't know exactly how many trees, but it's it's below six or the, even, I don't, it may only be a hand, a couple uh, that are, we, we were able to keep all of the ones around the south where the study grove is. And then this line of trees is actually in. I think the next slide. Oh yeah, that's why I put it in there. All right. <laughs> so so these this line of trees is tall. Um, I can't remember if they're like elms or um, that are that are out. Uh, the current roadway goes near, so we're able to preserve those and keep them. Uh, we've turned that into a, another grove with picnic tables, uh, and then all these are here. This is already luckily this was already cleared because it has so many so much play equipment in it they believe there was one in the near the spray ground that had to come out so i i i may i, I may need to go check I that i think there's some mature crate myrtles too that we've been looking at i think rat repairs rat repairs that's what it is rat repairs, repairs that are, that are mature um, beyond their typical life and so there might be some of those but we will be replacing trees and making sure that it's landscaped really and a last question uh how you uh, set it up out there for security cameras around the area uh, we do have some cameras in the area already and we'll be adding some as well once it's all set and done. Oh, that brings up another question um, if i remember there was going to be wi-fi in the study area or set up in the entire park for the wi-fi for students to study in the quiet areas and so forth yes i believe the uh, senior center wi-fi also reaches to a certain area currently yes yeah, anything else all right very good oh one last comment. Okay. 
I am very happy to see that the open space is being maintained except for that group shelter that's going to impinge on it just a little bit because I see a lot of uh, activity on that big open space. It's, you know, kids are being trained in soccer. There's a lot of group calisthenics that go on in there. So I'm pretty sure that our citizens are going to be very happy that that open space is not going to be restricted upon in any way. It's going to be maintained. It's, it's a great area. And I think this fort or this structure with the tot and everything, we're going to be overrun by citizens from outside. This this is going to be a, a, a landmark for Southern Dallas County. So appreciate all the work that's been done on the architecture and all of your work on this. This is this is really phenomenal. Thank you. Now, last question: Should we stop saying splash pad and say spray ground? It's interchangeable. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I say both. Uh, I, okay. Citizens understand splash. Just pad. don't say water park. That's where people know. Right. That's a different thing. Yeah. Spray ground, splash pattern. Okay. Very good. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. For you. Time. Thanks for coming. All right, that concludes our briefing presentations. We are pretty well on time. And I think we can go ahead and go into executive session. Okay, so the timestamp is 6.32 for we'll recess. Okay. Uh, the timestamp are opening our city council meeting on February the 15th, 2022 is 7.03. Thank you very much. A uh, quick bit of housekeeping. We were not able to complete all the information we needed to get during our executive session. So at this conclusion of tonight's city council meeting, we will be going back into executive session. Uh, so at what point in time we'll actually come out of that executive session and then reopen the open portion of the city council meeting, we have no idea. So you're gonna have to bear with us if you wanna stay till like 12 or one o'clock, I don't know. Uh, you know, that's going to be up to you, but that's what, that's what we need to do. Uh, so to get underway, uh, we need to move a little promptly tonight because there's an individual here that needs to uh, get to something else, and we're going to be able to accommodate him to the greatest degree possible. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and get to where I need to be. And we'll first have our invocation by Dr. Ginger Hurdenstein Conley from First Presbyterian Church. Please rise. Mayor Gordon, council members, leaders, and citizens, will you bow with me, please? God, we come to you. We thank you for leaders and citizens who are willing to pray and seek wisdom from you. We tend to, in our humanness, rely on our own wisdom and believe in our own power Yet you have the vast insight to help us see the truth and then put the good of others before ourselves. In that way, we begin to, to be the city that cares. Tonight, we ask you to cancel COVID. This may seem to be a large and naive request, yet you alone hold the authority to overcome its consequences. We ask that our children, teachers, and schools be restored, our workplaces recover and stabilize, churches be once again filled with people, and city governments return to normalcy. As we re-engage with the work of our city in 2022, may our leaders, both old and new, ask for your solid direction. Lord, we ask that those who run for office in our upcoming local elections commit themselves to extraordinary attitudes of humility, vision, and service, rather than sinking into pride, spite, and backbiting. Let Duncanville set the positivity standard, for we affect one another, Lord, and unity in our leaders will lead to a community in unity, making Duncanville all the better. Let us hear these words in the name of your Son, who teaches us always to ask and never give up. Amen. Amen. Please join me in pledges to our flags. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. Please be seated. 
I have the permission of council to modify the, the uh, order of our agenda tonight because I have a special presentation to make and the individual receiving it has some other obligations in terms of time-wise. Uh, so what we're going to do is go to item number two on the agenda, which is proclamations and presentations and recognition of the mayor's champion of the city. And with that, I would like to ask Mr. Tim Maiden to come forward, please. So why are we in such a hurry? Because this guy has a class to teach at 7 o'clock. <laughs> and he's going to be running late already for that. But when, I, when I, I contacted Tim and I told him that I'd like to honor him as a champion of our city, he said, well, you know, what about it? I said, 7 o'clock. He says, I've got, I've got a virtual class, an online class that starts at 7. And he's already told him it's going to be a little bit late. So we appreciate that. So Tim, I'd like to honor you as a champion of our city. Let me read the the citation for you. Mr. Tim Maiden is widely regarded for his business and banking acumen, having been recognized twice by the Dallas Business Journal for his outstanding leadership and entrepreneurship. He is how so highly invested in our community. Mr. Maiden currently serves on the board of directors of the Duncanville Outreach Ministry and the Duncanville Chamber of Commerce. He actively supports the Best Southwest Regional Chamber the Duncanville Community Theater, and the Duncanville Education Foundation. In addition to his service to the city, Tim and his identical twin brother, Terrence, operate Two Wins. This nonprofit, established in 2005, invests in resources to address social and educational gaps while providing mentorship to disadvantaged students. The holder of multiple graduate degrees, Tim is currently a senior vice president at Simmons Bank and an adjunct professor at the University of North Texas at Dallas, where he serves on the advisory board for the School of Business. For his sustained contributions to our municipality, Mr. Tim Maiden is hereby recognized as a champion of the city. As mayor of the city of Duncanville, I ask our residents to join me in congratulating Mr. Maiden on this memorable occasion. Tim, we're so thankful for you and all you do for our city. Well, first of all, I'm honored to be here tonight and to uh, receive or be the recipient of such recognition. Uh, Mayor Gordon uh, has been an example and model for me for our servant leadership, your business acumen, and just a husband. Uh, so I definitely, uh, you know, continue to aspire to serve like you do. Uh, thank you to the city of Duncanville for this esteemed recognition. So undeserving, but I appreciate it. And it just challenged me to do more and serve more and dig a little bit deeper to continue to make our city the city of champions. So thank you. Thank you, Tim. We'll take a photo. Thank you, Council, for accommodating Mr. Maiden and his, his time schedule. Okay, so we're going to go a little bit in reverse. Item number one, uh, Mayor's Report. Very quickly, uh, it may be recognized by others that are in here tonight, but in our weekly report, for the first time in the history of the Duncanville Police Department, an officer received a 35-year service award. And this was given to Officer Doug Sisk, and he's not here tonight. <laughs> uh, 
As I uh, understand, uh, Officer Sisk is retiring at the end of March. And with those 35 years, just think of the investment uh, that he has given to us and to our city as a law enforcement officer. And to remain with us for that amount of time is truly remarkable and noteworthy. So I just wanted to recognize Officer Sisk and Chief, if you pass that on to him, and Assistant Chief, officer, when you see him, say, Mayor said thanks. The council said thanks. We appreciate that. Y'all said thanks. <laughs> Uh, another thing I'd like to mention, uh, I was mentioned on our weekly report, that during Ice Storm Landon, that a lot of our, many of our essential employees remained here in the city. They did not go home. They slept uh, either here in City Hall, they slept at the rec center, they slept in the library, they slept in hotels, because they needed to be available if we had any emergencies like we had with Storm Uri. So along with that, we want to thank uh, the Economic Development, Finance, and Parks and Recs departments pitched in to feed our first responders and our essential workers during Ice Storm Landon. And the food was supplied by Roma's Italian Bistro, D Squared Catering, Golden Chick, the Mudhook Barn Kitchen for providing food so that we could feed our essential workers and our staff serve them as well. So congratulations and such a great thank you to all of the people that cooperated and helped our central workers during that time. Uh, the final thing I would like to say is that on January 23rd, uh, my next uh, coffee with the mayor that I've been having for several months now uh, is going to be a guest. His name is Nicholas Solorzano, and he is the assistant elections official administrator for, the Dal for Dallas County. If you've been keeping up with what's been going on in terms of the voters' bills that were passed during our last legislature, there's some confusion on the part of individuals how to get a mail-in ballot, how to do a mail-in ballot. And so Mr. Solorzano will be present to in give us some instruction and guidance on how to do that. Uh, I've been on two, two virtual meetings so far with, these, with, uh, with lawmakers in terms of these items. And it can get confusing, but I've asked Mr. Solorzano to be present to help give some guidance, and we'll pass that on through our PIO afterwards so that that. So thank you for that. And moving on, we'll do any council members' uh, reports. Any council members' reports? Oh, Mr. Cooks, please. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd just like to announce, and good evening, uh, that the Meet, Connect, and Learn we will still have on February the 26th. Uh, this month, we will focus on uh, National Libraries Month. Actually, today is National Libraries Day. And so on the 26th, we will host meeting uh, our librarian as well as local authors uh, in Duncanville. So please join us on February 26th, either by Zoom or live, and you're invited to participate and hear more about our library and authors in Duncanville. Thank you very much. Did I say January 23rd? February 23rd, <laughs> coffee with the mayor, February 23rd. I was just going like, no, a month has passed. Okay. Uh, one other uh, bit of housekeeping, if I may, council. Uh, again, we have our barriers up. And so uh, when you're speaking, please uh, raise your voice level just a little bit uh, more than normal because the microphones do not project sound into us. We have to listen to what is going on adjacent to us. So you and out in the audience can hear quite clearly but it may be a little difficult here. So if you would, as we speak, uh, to speak up. Yes, Mr. McBurnett, please. Thank you, Mayor. I'd, I'd just like to take opportunity, because we had another person I'd kind of consider as the champion of the city as well. His name was George Turner. He's a Duncanville graduate, and he uh, worked for Mr. Contreras as well when he was with the city, and he recently passed away, and I just wanted to acknowledge him. He also served on our PNZ board for for uh, a time as well. So uh, a shout out for him and his family. I am did I was not aware of that. I'm very sorry to hear that. Mr. Turner was a wonderful guy. Thank you for that, Don. Any other council members report? Mr. Contreras, yes, sir. Well, I'd just like to repeat uh, condolences to the Turner family. Um, uh, George worked with me for 10 years. He was a longtime Dallas employee. But uh, beyond that, uh, on a personal level, he, he was a great example of helping others. He did many things that uh, people don't know about, and he didn't brag about it, but uh, 
it will truly be missed by the city. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other reports? Well, I do need to mention that uh, Mr. Vera Cruz is not here tonight. Uh, he has other responsibilities that he has to take care of as the chaplain for the Dallas Fire Department. So we know that he is very busy tonight with, with other things of a much more somber and, and sad nature. So we will be missing Ver Mr. Vera Cruz. Seeing no other uh, council members reports, city managers report, please. Ms. Ver Farrell Benavides. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor and Council. I just want to give you an update. Parks and Recreation, uh, come join Keep Duncanville Beautiful in the community on February 19th, 2022 from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. in cleaning up the vacant city-owned land just north of Daniel Dell between Cedar Hill Road and Santa Fe, uh, 627 West Daniel Dell. This is also known as the Lad property and has a beautiful section of 10 Mile Creek running through it. Uh, this will be an opportunity for folks to come out and help and volunteer. Website updates. Uh, work continues on the migration documents for the new website. Many of you have mentioned the fact that we need to uh, update it, and we have been working. Uh, Alex has been working very closely with our new provider on updates to our, our website. Uh, one of the things that we have to do is review every link and every connection to the website. It's a very long process, but it's to ensure that they are accurate. The document will be used uh, to help us move the content to the new website. Uh, the company that we're working with is working on coding and hosting our new website. They've submitted the new Duncanville Fillhouse proof, and the proof has been sent to Fillhouse Management. So we're not just doing a website for the city, but it is also an economic development and a field house website. Public Works, uh, our rental registry program. Since its inception, the single family home rental registry program had a total of 1,747 uh, family rentals have been registered and a total of 711 certificate of occupancies have been issued with this program. Within our police department, uh, one of our updates there is our recruitment for Officer Ralston Marshall graduated from the North Central Texas Council of Government Police Academy, uh, also serving as the vice president. He will begin his in-service with the department training soon. Uh, Officer Kyle Willing received a commendation uh, bar for his efforts with the implementation of our drone program. Sergeant Fries received a letter of commendation from Krav Maga for his work during the defensive tactics recertification. And as the mayor mentioned, as once again we thank uh, Officer Doug Sist, uh, he has received our first ever 35-year service award. The library will hold a January blood drive. They collected 23 pints of blood uh, with 19 whole blood collections and two power red procedures. That translates into 61 potential hospital patients that could receive life-saving transfusion. And last but certainly not least, uh, as we have been working to fill our vacant IT director, our newly titled Chief Information Officer, we received over 30 applications uh, for this job. Uh, between January 14th and 19th, uh, my senior team interviewed about nine individuals. Uh, we held a second round of inside interviews with four finalists. And during that uh, interview, we had interviews with the IT staff and our entire mix of our senior staff, which I, turns into about 25 different tabletop interviews. Uh, ultimately, we have narrowed the process down to two finalists. Uh, we are doing background checks and uh, hope that an announcement will be made by Friday by Chief Brown on the selection of our new IT director. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Ms. Farrell Benvides. Moving on to item number three on our agenda is citizens' input. And pursuant to section 551.007 of the Texas Government Code, any member of the public has the opportunity to address the City Council concerning any matter of public business or any posted agenda item. However, the Act prohibits the City Council from deliberating any issues not on the public agenda, and such non-agenda issues may be referred to City staff for research and any future action. All persons addressing are subject to council adopted rules and limitations. And our city council rules and limitations do limit those comments to two minutes. Uh, we do have uh, both video and in present uh, the possibility for citizens to make comments. City Secretary, do we have anybody online that wish to make a comment? We do not. Moving on to those individuals. I see I, two individuals have submitted cards to speak as citizen comments and they have related those cards to two agenda items. So what I'm going to do, rather than put those in open session, is call those individuals forward to speak when we come to that particular individual item on our agenda. 
So the first comment that I have is from Ron McCarty, P.O. Box 381817, Duncanville, Texas, 75138. Mayor to read comment. My name is Ron McCarty, and I am a member of the Duncanville Police Officers Association. The purpose of this email is to communicate to you my thoughts of our members pertaining to the proposed elimination of the second assistant police chief position, which is set to be presented to you on February 15, 2022. We find this confusing as the position was created only a few months ago and is now stated to be eliminated without even attempting to implement the concept to evaluate the positive and negative attributes that this would provide for the city. I would like to make it known that we support the creation of the, assistant, the second assistant police chief position and oppose the elimination of said position. The City of Duncanville is currently experiencing growth, which will only cause an increase in responsibilities for the Duncanville Police Department. The position of Assistant Police Chief is fraught with responsibilities and duties to the point that some of these responsibilities are divvied up amongst other supervisors and command staff. This causes those supervisors to have less time to properly supervise their subordinates. The addition of an Assistant Police Chief would allow these supervisors to coach and mentor their officers to provide a superior work product to the citizens of our city. The addition of an assistant police chief would also provide a buffer from the police chief's office and the rest of the department, while also allowing the assistant police chiefs being able to supervise the command staff and become more invested with those that they oversee. The police department will only need to grow with the increase in commerce and population within the city. The second assistant police chief position will be needed soon. Putting this in place now is laying a foundation for the expansion of the police department now. Thank you for your time. Respectfully, Ron McCarty. The second individual that has submitted a comment is Nathan Roach. Uh, uh, Nathan Roach, 203 East Wheatland Road, Duncanville, Texas. And reading his comment, it is verbatim to the comment that I just read. So that will be entered into the record as a verbatim second comment exactly as the first. The next uh, citizen comment that I have is from Patricia Ebert, 115 South Greenstone Lane, 75116. City Secretary Downs, please have the mayor or his designate read my public comments. As our city quickly approaches campaign season for the May 7 city elections, best practices, if not ethics, and the city charter would necessitate the suspension of any and all singular activities by any sitting councilman who is campaigning for re-election that involves city staff and or city facilities. Such activities could include, but not limited to, events hosted by one sitting councilman with the aid of city staff, but without the whole council hosting or in attendance. Colon, bullet one, coffees at the senior service, at the senior citizen center. Bullet two, town hall-like events. Bullet three, award to citizens during city council meetings. Events such as the above give an unfair advantage to a sitting councilman while campaigning with his opponents I wish each and every candidate a successful campaign. The final citizen comment that's been written in uh, is from Gary Bennett. Gary Bennett is 215 Calder Avenue, zip code 75116. The Honorable Mayor did return my call this afternoon. I appreciate it very much. There is, parking, there is a parking lot on Main Street. Liquor bottles, fast food trash are left overnight and usually for days at a time. Last year, I contacted code enforcement, health inspector, assistant city manager, city manager about it. Last week, a tequila bottle and two Corona bottles along with fast food trash and red plastic cups, I guess from bar inside were left in parking lot from Saturday morning till Thursday afternoon. Leaving fast food trash overnight in a parking lot is a health code violation. This is not the Duncanville I grew up in. All above named employees need to be terminated. This has been ongoing for a few years. Also, why is city charter being ignored on certain employees living in city limits? Why, is, has, why was another police chief hired that doesn't live here? Just like assistant city manager wants to get rich but wouldn't live here if we paid him, I thank the council for this service, Gary Bennett. That concludes our portion of the city I'm sorry, citizens input. Moving on to the consent agenda, item number four, 
uh, for information purposes for our citizens during our briefing session it was uh, recommended and the council agreed that item 5d is in David would be moved to consent agenda item so agenda item 5d will be read by city secretary as a consent agenda item uh, city secretary please read item number four consent agenda item 4a consider the minutes for the october 19 2021 city council regular meeting december 7th city council regular meeting december 21st city council regular meeting and the january 18th uh, 2022 city council regular meeting Item 5D, consider a resolution approving amendment number one to the interlocal agreement with the city of Dallas for intersection traffic control operations and maintenance. Thank you, Chair. I'll accept a motion to approve. So move. Second. We have a motion to approve by Mr. McBurnett, second by Mr. Harvey. Council, please vote on the approval of consent agenda. Thank you. Unanimously approved. Moving on to item five, items for individual consideration. Consider an ordinance amending chapter 16A, sign guidelines, article two, definitions, section 16A-5, definitions by amending definition for canvassing, by amending the definition for electioneering sign to election sign, by amending the definition of political sign by amending chapter 16A, sign guidelines, article seven, rules for specific sign types, section 16A-35, political signs by repealing section 16A-35 in its entirety and replacing it with a new section 16A-35, political and election signs. Before we proceed with the presentation, I will call forward a citizen, Erica Browning, whose card indicates that she would like to speak on item 5A. And for the record, please state your name and address, Ms. Browning. Erica Browning, 442 East Cherry Street. Um, in addition, my card um, mentioned that I wanted to make a comment about Armstrong Park, and I just had a couple of questions regarding that. Um, regarding the hammocks, um, I just wondered how, what they were going to do to make sure that the homeless don't use them at night. And um, it was mentioned later that there were going to be security cameras, and I just wondered who was going to be monitoring those and how that would be enforced. Noted. Regarding uh, 5A, Sorry, five, yeah, five A. Um, under section 16, A35 of the, um, the ordinance, um, A2, it says that any sign on private property as provided in these subsections, however, may not exceed eight feet in height. And I just wondered if that would include um, a, uh, a political flag on a flagpole that might exceed eight feet, because it doesn't say. And then also, in um, on the sorry on the bottom of page three, section E, um, this is very concerning to me um, that any person, firm, or corporation violating any of the provisions or terms of this section as amended hereby shall be guilty of a misdemeanor, and upon conviction in the municipal court of the city sh shall be subjected to a fine, not to exceed the sum of two hundred and fifty dollars for each offense, and each and every occurrence and and day such violation is continued shall be deemed to constitute a separate offense. Does this include people who just inadvertently break the, the rule or is it somebody who has already been given a warning and be, you know, been deemed to be flouting the law because that's a, a very severe punishment for somebody who just happens to break the, the rule. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, presenting this particular item, uh, Mr. Sky Thibodeau, and I believe City Attorney, uh, in these comments I have asked to be included with this particular item, either Mr. Sky Thibodeau or City Manager may respond to those particular items. Thank, Thank you. you, Mayor Council. Go ahead, Mr. Thibodeau. Thank you. Um, this is a follow-up from the briefing made on, at the January 5th, 2022 uh, City Council meeting. Um, I'll move to this section. Really, this was predominantly done by uh, our attorney, Mr. Hager, who apparently found the the fountain of youth and uh, you look very good in your young form <laughs> but, uh, so basically we made some minor changes we held the uh, the language very similar the uh, the passage uh, the last passage uh, um, she just read really just stayed the same from before and um, I'll be happy to answer those questions uh, as well so we'll go through the changes that are proposed first though based on that conversation from January 5th 
um, basically changing the section moniker from political sign to political and election sign. <clears throat> if you remember that from that conversation, uh, delineating between political sign and election sign, a political sign making a political statement that might not necessarily have to do with the election taking place is different from an election sign. So we want to distinguish the two with this, with this amendment. Um, and again, amending the definition from election nearing sign to election sign, uh, amending the definition for political sign, and amending the rules for specific times, uh, sign types in Article 8 to reflect the proposed changes. And as you notice, the, as I said, the language didn't really change. You'll just see that uh, the areas just were uh, definitive in if we're talking about a election sign here, a political sign there, or both. And so those were the proposed changes. So to answer the uh, the first question, uh, remind me the first. The first question was, uh, I believe that there's the possibility of somebody flying a, a flag, oh, an election yeah. flag from a flagpole so, exceeding eight feet in length. Right. So a flag is not a sign. So that would be a different matter. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the second one. The second is one was if somebody is violating the mm -hmm. the um, the ordinance. Yeah. Basically. He, Essentially, they get some warnings before they're issued a citation. Sure. That would be the process. Uh, Mayor, I'll respond to that. Uh, we have a process where, uh, specifically during election season, our city mm -hmm. secretary will contact individuals and give them the opportunity to remove their signs. And then when staff removes the signs, we will place them and we will explain that to all individuals. Uh, ultimately, the last thing we would do, if, and you are correct, if it is a habitual person who just refuses to do anything and continues, that is when we get to the fine. But our team will work to, once again, place them at the service center for them to be picked up. Uh, if we have to remove them. But our goal would be we will take a picture of it before removing the sign because we want to document it. We never want to be accused of getting involved in it other than things that are blatantly violations. And so that would be a last resort. Okay, thank you. Any uh, discussion by council members? Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion to approve. So, so we have a motion to approve of Mr. Cooks, second by uh, Mayor Pro Tem Harvey. Council, please vote. The item is unanimously approved. Thank you very much. Moving on to item 5B. Consider amending ordinance 2420 by deleting an assistant chief position on the civil service and the police and fire departments, repealing our ordinances in conflict herewith. And to present this, Assistant City Manager Brown. Sir, the floor is yours. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Mayor. And good evening to you, Mayor and Council, and thank you for the opportunity to present this item. Um, I would like to briefly share with the Council some expenditures that the City of Duncanville will incur over the next uh, few days as well as the next few weeks. Uh, in accordance with Chapter 143 of the Texas Local oh, Government Code, oh, the City me, of Duncanville... So, Mr. Brown, I... Excuse me, I, I was supposed to call on uh, the individual who submitted a comment first before you. Yes. So if I could interrupt you, please. Uh, this is from uh, Andrew Armstrong. Sorry. Mr. Armstrong. And please state your name and address for the record. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sorry. Um, my name is Andrew Armstrong. My address is 203 East Wheeling Road, Duncanville, Texas. Okay, so mayor, council members, and city manager, my name is Andrew Armstrong. I'm the representative of the Duncanville Police Officers Association. I'm speaking before you tonight to voice the association's opinion concerning an issue that is on the agenda tonight. This issue is the prop uh, proposed elimination of the second assistant police chief uh, position. The duties of the assistant police chief are numerous and hard to fully comprehend. Some of these duties include managing the largest budget of any department within the city, managing the police department fleet, uh, creating and implementing policy, reviewing all use of force incidents, along with many other duties to keep the proverbial cogs moving within the police department. The city of Duncanville is growing, and with it, the police department will have to grow as well. It would be a benefit to have a strong command structure to use as the foundation for that growth. The addition of a second assistant police chief would allow a division of duties wherein one could be over operations, super, supervising and fostering new ideas to better service, uh, for better service to our citizens, while the other could be over administration, overseeing the budget and uh, seeking funding from grants to produce cutting edge services at a lower cost to our citizens. 
Our members understand that money does not grow on trees, which is unfortunate as we are Tree City USA, and that there are many, uh, that there may be budget constraints prohibiting this position at this time, but we want it to be known that our association supports fully the implementation of a second assistant police chief. We feel that the goal of providing a safe and inclusive community starts with effective leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. Okay, Mr. Brown, please, uh, if you would, start from the very beginning, please. Absolutely. All right, good evening again, Mayor and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to present this item. Um, I'd like to briefly share with the Council some expenditures that the City of Duncanville will incur over the next days and weeks. In accordance with Chapter 143, of the Texas Local Government Code, the City of Duncanville will incur several sick leave payouts and accrued vacation payouts in the very near future. On February the 17th, approximately $50,000 for 720 hours of sick leave will be paid to a member of the police department. On February the 17th, approximately $50,000 for 720 hours of sick leave will be paid to a member of the fire department. In March of this year, approximately 41,000 for 720 hours of sick leave and approximately $19,000 in unused accrued vacation time will be paid to a member of the fire department. In April of this year, approximately $27,000 for 720 hours of sick leave and approximately $11,000 in unused accrued vacation will be paid to a member of the police department. That's a total of $198,000. Recently, an engine in our reserve ambulance went out and that engine needs to be replaced. The cost is $14,000. The former Duncanville Library, which is located at 103 East Wheatland Road, experienced roof damage during our recent winter storm it costs $4,500 to repair that roof. The roof needs to be replaced. Staff will budget for replacement in fiscal year 23. A police employee was recently terminated. The employee appealed his termination. The employee's attorney has inquired if the city is willing to enter into a, a negotiation to drop that appeal. Our city attorney is currently uh, handling that negotiation. It would be irresponsible for me as the assistant city manager not to bring this to your attention. That's a tremendous amount of money. I want this council to know that I love this police department and this is in no way um, um, something that I would do to hurt our police department. As assistant city manager, I have a responsibility to bring this to your attention as you make your decision on this item. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, Mr. Harvey, please. So um, I have some questions and um, not particularly designated to a um, ACM Brown, maybe you could answer it, or if not, the city manager could answer it. But um, in the of adopting the budget for this current fiscal year we adopted a balanced budget did we not yes, yes and so in our considerations to uh, do we consider any and all eventualities in, in putting together said budget uh, no, sir, because one of the things that we've discovered, and as I start to better understand civil service, is that uh, we cannot predict who will retire or leave, but there is a cost associated with any civil service departure. Okay. The reason why I bring that up is because that, that reminds me of, of, I think, of George Foreman or somebody like that that says every fighter comes into the ring with a plan and then he gets hit. So my point is that uh, these elements that have happened to the budget, 
that were not foreseen and I want to foresee every situation or circumstance. Since these things have come up, then we are hopeful that we can end the year with a balanced budget, taking care of these uh, necessities. Hopefully, more revenue will come in. Or if more revenue doesn't come in, then we'll have to, I imagine, look and see what services would need to be cut in order to balance the budget. That, that would be the process, right? Yes, sir. At this point in time, uh, as we look at our budget and look at the numbers, uh, and I think as mentioned earlier, um, and that I don't think our, our chief mentioned, is that this was actually a position that was not budgeted. And so uh, the reason for the elimination is the fact that it wasn't budgeted. We were hoping that if we had some savings, we would be able to include this uh, uh, once we did the appointment of the chief. And so we did not have a budget that it does have some surplus budgeted in it. But at this point in time, we are moving slowly and quickly into it. And so at this time, I can't tell you what's going to happen next, but I do know that we have to be careful and uh, not be able to keep the position uh, as it is. Now, our attorney has advised me that because it is actually, although it's on the books and it is a unfunded position, the official elimination is not necessary because it is not a budgeted position. We only budgeted for one assistant chief position. And so therefore, there was not a need to eliminate it, but we wanted to make sure we brought this to your attention if questions came up of why we were not feeling it. And, and there's, there's nothing that would preclude uh, in the next few weeks when, when we go through budget deliberations again, there's nothing that would preclude um, putting this particular initiative of another assistant chief into the hopper with other needs and just reevaluate it at that point, and it could possibly be an element for consideration in next year's budget, would it not? Uh, yes, sir, Council Member. I actually asked uh, for this position. I've been talking to our interim chief for a while about uh, what we need. And so one of the things that uh, we've talked about even today is looking at our operations as a whole. We've got to look at what does our city look like and what are our police uh, needs look like in the future. And so as we start to prepare for the budget uh, from a management, but also from a patrol level and overall officers, I'm interested in understanding what is next year's look, but also what does five years from now look like in public safety. And so uh, that is a conversation that we're going to be working on with our business plan. If I, if I could humbly recommend, uh, because as we move forward as an organization, there are going to be other employees that are going to retire and going to require payouts. Uh, we have certainly done what it takes in order to earn uh, their, their service. Uh, so if we could give some consideration as we move forward in the budget process to provide some resources uh, to turn to as we move forward as an organization, as other people, employees retire, just for consideration. Thank you. So just for information before I move on to other council members, I see that everybody would like to make a comment that um, I think for uh, Mr. Armstrong and those other individuals who have commented on this particular item, we as a city and staff would would most like to have this position. And at some point in time, we would reinstate this thing. Uh, right now, our fiduciary responsibility relies on the expenditures unplanned for, but we will plan for them much better in the future. I just wanted to make that comment that we know what a great police department we have. We want to do everything we can to support them. This ran into some unexpected, unforeseen expenditures accounted for. And I'm sure that we will, as Mr. Harvey has recommended, be giving those in consideration for our future budget. Uh, so just for information as well, as this is an unfunded uh, position, the item that we have before us where it says consider amending, 
there is no action required on this because there is nothing to, to take action upon because it's an unfunded position. So just understand that, City Council members, that at the end of our discussions, this is purely for information and input. We will not be taking a vote on this particular item. Okay, so Mr. McBurnett, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I, I think between Mr. Harvey and you, you've pretty much summed it up, and, and uh, ACM Brown, my question was ultimately going to start off with, just so for people to understand that civil service it is a requirement, and it's something that we have to do. Absolutely. It's, it's state law. All right. So with that, I, I mean, I think it's been adequately explained by, by our leadership. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Coons. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so my, my understanding is that the previous ordinance that you know, we passed that November 16th, 2021. So that was just a couple of months ago, right? That yes, we, sir. That, okay. Yes, sir. And we passed that ordinance knowing we didn't have a budget for the position. Yes, sir. As I stated when we uh, passed it, this was passed because currently our, our current chief is sitting in the actual assistant city manager position. And in order for him to permanently fill that position, which has gone on for a while, we needed a second position. And so in the, uh, uh, when I spoke, I mentioned that we would use this position in order to allow him to fill the position. Uh, the question did come from Mr. Vera Cruz with this once he was appointed and I said we would see at that time if there was funding available and as we look and we are about to appoint him today I hope uh, there are there is not funding available to continue this okay so to answer the question yes we created the position we created without it without thinking about what, what we, the budget would yes we created it based on the budget for the existing uh, chief so right now we have a interim chief who actually sits in the assistant chief position and so we had a vacancy for an assistant chief However, as most people come about, uh, we needed to have a different tool in order for him to do a permanent hire for his assistant chief. And so in creating this position, it allowed him to hire for his assistant chief. Our hope would be if that we decided later on that we wanted the second chief after the appointment, then that would be something we could consider. But we knew at that time that this was an unfunded position. And I think a couple of council members in watching the video actually asked that, including Council Member Harvey. And I said, yes, this is an unfunded position. Thank you. And then no one was actually appointed to that second position? Correct. No, sir. OK, good. And then uh, just one last question. Uh, what, what's the actual cost of maintaining? If, if, if we were to actually maintain that position, what, what would be the cost? That's a good question, sir. I, I don't have that salary range in front of me. That salary would include um, benefits as well, but I'll be happy to get that from our HR department and provide that to you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. OK, uh, Mr. Cooks. Yeah, you know, I'll just uh, echo, I think, what everybody just said, and I won't belabor the point, but, but to say we know that any time that we uh, add to staff that our command, our supervisors per se, will need to be added as well. And so we did add two additional officers. Uh, since then, one, uh, one of those additional officers was uh, sent to uh, another, uh, an assignment, will be sent to another assignment. So I just hope we continue to add officers and as we do, we also know that that will determine that another command structure would need to come in place at that point. But uh, I, do, I do recognize that we did, I didn't think we did a second position. It was temporary based upon what we were doing tonight. So I uh, just wanted to kind of add that point for us, adding additional officers. And may I say, adding additional officers was to me, recognized that was gonna be officers on the street and not necessarily uh, in the offices, so we need more officers on the street. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes what I see as uh, comments from City Council. Uh, if there's no other further discussion, this is an information item only. And thank you very much, uh, Assistant City Manager Brown and City Manager Farrell Benavides for your transparency and understanding where we are in terms of what we as a council understand for our future in terms of the budgeting process. Thank you very much. Moving on to item C, consider resolution to confirm the appointment, appointment of Mark Levigny as police chief, effective February 15th, 2022. Assistant City Manager Brown, the floor is yours, sir. 
Yes, sir. Thank you again, Mayor and Council, for the opportunity to present this item. If I may, I just got a few comments that I'd like to make before we move forward with this uh, particular agenda item. I want to tell the Council, uh, I want to tell the citizens that are viewing this uh, Council meeting tonight, I want to tell everyone that, that's present this evening that I'm not ashamed to tell you that I spent many nights on my knees praying for the opportunity to become a police chief. And on February the 5th of 2007, God answered my prayer. Um, I was appointed police chief for the city of Duncanville. And I will tell you that it was one of the happiest days of my life. Um, to have the opportunity to serve the men, uh, the men and women of this community, the citizens of this community, has truly been a joy for me. So I wanted to first begin by uh, expressing my thank you I want you to know from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, I am truly, truly grateful to this city for the opportunity to serve as your police chief. Um, secondly, I want to say to the men and women of the Duncanville Police Department, um, I've observed some outstanding work from the men and women of the Duncanville Police Department during my tour. And I just want to share a few things that I've observed. On several occasions, I've observed Duncanville Police Department officers enter dangerous dwellings not knowing if they would come out alive. I am aware of Duncanville police officers who purchase meals for the less fortunate with their own money. I'm aware of Duncanville police officers who chose not to use deadly force when they was authorized to do so. I'm aware of Duncanville police officers and excuse me, civilian police employees who volunteered their time wrapping and delivering Christmas gifts to the less fortunate during the holidays. I'm aware of a Duncanville police officer who is directly responsible for our fire truck pool being the largest in the state of Texas, raising thousands of dollars for Special Olympics. I'm aware of a Duncanville police officer who is so courteous and so professional <laughs> that doing traffic stops when he writes citations, people will call in and give him commendations. The men and women of the Duncanville Police Department are an incredible group, ladies and gentlemen. I consider them one of the best police departments in the state of Texas, if, if not the nation. And it was truly my honor and privilege to serve as their leader. And I want to just say thank you to the, to the Duncanville police officers. Thank you guys very much. And last but not least, I, I want to just have a, uh, a few comments uh, for um, hopefully our next chief, Mark Levigny. Um, there are four must-have attributes for police chiefs in this day and age. I believe that the top one is honesty and integrity. These two characteristics must be well ingrained in police chiefs as they are often responsible for bottom line decisions that impact lives. The second one is open-minded and accessibility. Your way is not always the best way. Be an active listener and be approachable and available to this community. The third is a commitment to diversity. A police chief must be willing to work with all officers of all ages, races, religions, and ethnicities and be committed to improving the diversity of the police department. And last but not least, the ability to lead. A police chief must lead his force of police officers by example, by being not only a responsible member of law enforcement, but a responsible member to the community that it serves. Over the past three and a half years, Mark has sat in the passenger seat, and I've invested in Mark. I've preached fairness, I've discussed and demonstrated these attributes that I have mentioned to you this evening. It is Mark's time to sit in the driver's seat. If this council chooses to confirm Mark as our next police chief, I want you to know that I've done everything in my power to prepare him for this role. I wish Mark nothing but success. I want him to know that the men and women of the Duncanville Police Department will be watching him. The citizens of this community will be watching him. This governing body will be watching him. And you can best believe city administration will be watching him. So mayor and council, if you choose to confirm our city managers um, 
recommendation for a police chief. I just want Mark to know that I wish him nothing but the best. Thank you, Mr. Brown. And it's very difficult to address you as Mr. Without the Chief. <laughs> and uh, I think we as a council recognize what a superb police department we have. And thank you for your leadership during that long tenure, much uh, longer than normal in terms of turnover around, around the nation for police chiefs. So for your dedication and loyalty to our city, we thank you uh, as, as the governing body. Uh, uh, before proceeding, uh, Mr. Cooks, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. In 2006, I, I moved to Duncanville, and one of the, one of the two people that I met uh, first was Greg Contreras, uh, crawling up in my attic. And then the second was Chief Robert Brown. And so before we moved to, to select the, the next chief, I wanted to personally thank Chief Brown for being a chief that we are very, very proud of in the Best Southwest. Chief Brown, we know that this is Black History Month. And often I think during Black History Month, I would recognize you as being the first uh, black police chief at Duncanville that will go down in history. Not because you were just the first black police chief in Duncanville, but because of your leadership and your fairness and your looking beyond others and to help, to help others as well as making sure you're, you're, we're very proud of you. So Chief, thank you very much on behalf of me and our, my family for all you did for our city, for leading our kids. I know when I called upon you to talk to students at the high school, you were there. I know that when I asked you to come walk the neighborhood with me, knocking on doors, you reluctantly did it, but you, you were there. <laughs> so Chief, I want to thank you very much for all of your hard work and all of your, and all of your dedication to our city. And then second to our city manager, we have an opportunity now to uh, take a look at our policies on where we need to go from here. And so I'm going to ask our city manager, I know we grandfathered uh, in uh, all of our assisting uh, uh, chiefs on their residents of where they live in Duncanville. So I'm going to ask our, our city manager at some point to bring this back to the council for us to look at the uh, residents of our administration and our staff. And we know according to the law that we can't say that they have to live here in Duncanville, but we, we, you can say that they live within a certain distance to get to the city. So I asked the city manager as we, uh, as we prepare to confirm another chief that she will bring that back to this council to look at for future policy recommendation. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Cooks. And with that, uh, the chair will entertain a motion. I'm sorry. Mayor, I'd like to uh, make the motion to approve. Second. We have a motion to approve and we have a second by Council Member Contreras. City Council, please vote on the con confirmation to affirm the appointment of Mark Lavigny as Police Chief, effective February 15th, 2022. Thank you for that, unanimous <laughs> council. And Chief, you have two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I want to take from a couple of days, but I will just take a minute to to, to address the council and. and uh, city manager and the citizens, uh, I'm incredibly humbled. And I have been given uh, just incredible opportunities as uh, in my over 28 years with the Duncanville Police Department. And I am so proud to serve this community, the City of Champions. And, um, you know, we're making good strides within the police department. We are a good department. We're going to be even better. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Congratulations again. Okay, item 5D was moved to consent item, which we've already taken care of. Uh, we have not yet finished executive session, so we're gonna skip 5E. And moving on to item six on our agenda, which is staff and board reports. And the first one we have is to receive the library quarterly report. Mr. Velasquez, please. Uh, 
still up. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council. Thank you for having me today. Uh, just we'll briefly go over the library quarterly report for you. Um, so uh, recently, we have continued to do our home delivery services at the library, uh, as well as we've started uh, from citizens who don't wish to leave their homes at this time. So that's been a very popular program. And considering we're still having issues with COVID and whatnot, that's been a very good uh, way for us to serve the, the community without them having to and compromise citizens there. Uh, we also recently entered that Best Southwest Consortium with the other libraries, uh, DeSoto, Cedar Hill, and Lancaster, and that's proved to be a very uh, successful program. And that's opened up more uh, accessibility to all the citizens of all the communities to materials and services. Uh, recently, we did have two vacated um, positions due to uh, retirements. And uh, these are part-time positions that we were able to put those out there and uh, conduct interviews. And we do have two offers for two new employees. So ideally, they'll be starting in a couple weeks. So we're very excited to have those folks aboard with us at the library. Uh, so recently, in our continued our uh, ready need literacy, which is a tutoring program that we worked in conjunction with the Duck of Ellen. So we're uh, working with first and second graders uh, and doing uh, weekly uh, tutoring sessions. And Council Member Coons has been uh, very uh, instrumental in being one of our tutors with those kids. And it's really a very, very good program for us. So uh, other programs that we have, um, we have coming up in the spring for spring break, a spring reading challenge. And we've also started uh, inviting local teens to uh, do book reviews and uh, and that way they um, assist the library in promoting reading and also get credit for schools for that too. Uh, also for African American History Month, uh, the last week we had virtual story times with Bill William King who did several online. Those are always been popular. It's about the third year we've had him with us and that's been a great program for us as well. Uh, we also continue to do weekly uh, virtual story times. Denine, who's our children's librarian, and those are great because it gives the opportunity for people who can't leave their homes or for families to watch over and over, not just one time. So uh, we did recently get uh, approved for funding through ARPA, and this money we will go through uh, a digital literacy program that we're looking at various options uh, that we offer our citizens uh, new ways to engage with the library and with technology as well. That's all I have. Is there any questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Velasquez. Any comments or questions from City Council? Uh, yes, Mr. Coons. Yes, sir. I just want to, do, do we have any active book clubs and could you tell us anything about those? Um, recently, uh, for youth that run that book club, there are two team volunteers from the high school that run that on, a, it's a virtual club that's going I'm on. The Pride Book Club? Uh, and then we have a couple other book clubs. We have a regular book club that meets at the library uh, that's run by citizens. It's not, it's hosted by us, but it's not run by us oh. at this time. Yeah. Are so, those in person or virtual? Uh, the, those are in person uh, and they will meet with us. And uh, I don't know if they went virtual during the time we were having availability, but they run those on their own, but we do host them. Okay. And, that, and that's not library programming. That's, that's not a library program, no, but it is a hosted program. Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Ms. Yes, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank Mr. Tony Gill for your service in the library. I understand this is the library month, and so yes. thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I know I've reached out to you to, but for recently updated, I'm going to go ahead and cancel that for this month. Okay. But I really want to thank you very much for your time of saying, yes, you will do it. Sure, sure So thank sure. you very much. You have yeah, a great no problem. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Velasquez. Appreciate everything you do for our intelligence and intellect in our library. Thank you. Moving on to item number 6B, receive the fiscal year 2022 first quarter investment report as of December 31st, 2021. And with that, our <laughs> Financial Services Managing Director, Adina Atmore. Ms. Atmore, the floor is yours. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, Council, and City Manager. Um, I, this is the first quarter investment report of the fiscal year 22, 2022. And so I'm gonna give you a kind of a brief overview of what's in your report in your package. You receive some details. And if you have any questions about that, I'd be happy um, to go over that with you. But um, this shows you the difference between, as of December the 31st, our portfolio is at 76 million, over 76 million, uh, which is up um, 
by a few million from 68 million in, in September. Um, you can see that our weighted average yield on the portfolio has kind of slightly gone down, and that's probably due to some CDs that have matured during this period uh, between September and, um, and uh, December. And so therefore, the rates are not as good right now. <laughs> And remember, this is not the stock market. Well, we, we are governed by the Public Funds Investment Act, and so we cannot invest in things uh, such as the stock market. Okay, so these are good rates as far as we're concerned. Um, and so you can see the interest, the difference in the interest between uh, September 30th and, um, and December. Um, this is the, uh, just a, a snapshot of the makeup of the portfolio. You can see that uh, we have about 35% in money markets and in government pools. There are 25% of the portfolio is in CDs, and 40% is in um, what we call demand deposits, which is basically Wells Fargo operating account. Uh, the distribution of the different maturities, uh, since most of our funds right now are in um, investment pools and also our Wells Fargo account. And I just want to remind you that Wells Fargo operating account is giving us 0.60% interest rate. I know that's not a whole lot, but it is more than anything else that we're getting out there right now. Uh, and so when the CDs matured, um, when I go in to solicit rates, uh, the rates are so low that it is hard for me to get anything better than Wells Fargo. So right now, um, uh, much of our funds are sitting there until we get back on the, uh, another strategy with the investment advisors to ladder out the portfolio to see if we can find some better um, returns on investments, okay? Um, also, we have, this is the benchmark, just to show you how we're performing uh, against other uh, benchmarks out there, the three-month treasury, the six-month treasury, and and text pool is like a government pool. So basically, you see, we're still outperforming those, those standard investments out there, those governments. Um, basically, this is the total performance. Again, just to give you another uh, a picture view of how we are outperforming uh, those benchmarks right now. And strategy we have is basically we're going to ladder out the portfolio as our cash flow permits, which meaning that I, I study the cash flow that the city goes through each year. We have property tax monies coming in, which that comes in the bulk between December. Um, December and April, we get a lot of it. January, it really starts coming in. So our, our account is sitting at uh, probably 70% of the property tax money that we're going to get right now this year. And so the rest will trickle in over, over the year until we end the year until it becomes a bare minimum. Uh, but so we're going to start in March. I will start investing back out with the uh, investment advisors, their advice and look at seeing what we can find that may strat I may go out and strategize into uh, municipals, municipal bonds, that's like with cities that are rated uh, investment grade, as well as other CDs, if I can find a good rate um, or treasuries and, and agencies out there, okay? And so the interest rates are expected to increase for, you know, we, we'll see just what happens. It's all a, you know, it's all a toss in the air, so we'll just see how it comes along. Uh, any questions? Yeah, I'm going to catch you cold with this one. Uh, we, the nation, has an inflation rate of 7.5%, which is the highest in what I've read three decades. Mm -hmm. We've been running 1.5, 1.2, 1.4 for the past eight years, you know, six, eight years. Have our investment counselors, advisors, uh, when you say looking at possibly increased interest rates, are they mm -hmm. anticipating that those interest rates on our portfolio are going to be affected to the positive as a result of the bond yields and with the inflation rate, because I know the bond yields and inflation rates sometimes operate in inverse relationships with mm -hmm. each other. So are they anticipating if inflation stays at the seven and a half, maybe even kicks up to eight, that it would be a blessing in disguise that we actually get more interest as a result of the inflation? <laughs> Cold question, I'm sorry for that. But. Yeah, that, that, that's a right now from what I can um, when working with the advisors is that the inflation as far as the investments right now concerned they expecting the interest rates to fly but not necessarily we looking at the the inflation on on the market right now we don't really know how that's going to play into the We're not really saying how that's going to play into the investment market but I can tell you on the yields on the bonds um, 
we just we don't have a lot of um, debt out there so you know that when we pay the interest on our bonds we are paying at a percentage that I can so that will affect what we actually yield out there on on the investments because I can't get I can't get three percent what I'm paying right now um, so therefore when we issue bonds we basically um, strategize on if we're actually going to do a project so we can get the money in and out as opposed to issuing it all at once but yeah that question is uh, I, I can't for you but I can tell you that it probably will have some impact but we're just not sure what that impact is going to be right now no oh, thank you I, I know that was a really <laughs> Deep, detailed, cold question. I don't really no. apologize for that, but you gave me you gave me a great answer, and I appreciate that. <laughs> great no answer. problem. Um, at the council members, uh, at uh, Ms. Atmore's request, uh, we do need someone to be on our investment committee. We have one open seat, from what I understand. Yes, it, sir. Does any council member wish to volunteer uh, at a great increase in pay? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to, to sit on that you. investment committee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Cooks has volunteered, so yes. make a record of that. Uh, uh, Councilmember Cooks will sit on our investment committee. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you very Mayor. much, Mr. Cooks, thank for you, that. Thank you, Mr. Cooks. Okay. That's it. All right. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Moving on to item number C. Uh, received the Police Department 2021 Racial Profiling Report. And giving us that, Assistant Police Chief Matt Stogner. Chief? Good evening. So you guys should be getting a packet or a binder. So thank you, Mayor and Council, and I appreciate the opportunity to provide you all with the 2021 Racial Profiling Report once we get there. There it is. Um, this report is mandated by law to provide or to be provided to the governing body uh, by March 1st. Uh, what we report are the motor vehicle stops resulting in a citation, warning, arrest, and a search. Um, as stated in the slide, we are fully compliant in the comparative analysis and our policies, um, our department education and training. Um, collection of the raw data, the complaint process, and public education of our complaint process. And the, the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement, which is what we call TCOL. Um, so moving on, um, we provide the data collected to an independent third party uh, for the analysis and final report. Uh, the analysis states that the Duncanville Police Department is fully compliant uh, with the st uh, Texas statutes. Um, so that's essentially the report, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you all have. It's quick. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, it was, I, I admit I didn't read all 44 pages because some of it was law, and I left that to you folks to figure of that course. out. But there's some important data that I extracted from it, and I think it attests to the competence of our police department in terms of the data that was extracted. One of the most important things that I found very interesting is it said that on page 8, 66% of the 5,953 traffic stops in our city, 66% of the time, our officers issued a verbal warning before giving a citation. And I think that speaks to the training, it speaks to the, to the discipline, it speaks to the wisdom and the discernment of all of our law enforcement officers to try and correct an issue rather than just giving a citation. So when we look at that, two thirds of those, let's call it 6,000 traffic stops, nobody was issued a citation, they were simply giving a warning saying, please be a better, law, more law-abiding citizen. I think that's a great credit uh, to the entire law enforcement. And if you'd pass that comment on to, to our, all, all of our police officers, I'd appreciate that. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing uh, that I had a, a question on, what there was a, <coughs> looking at some of the data, it, there was uh, something about a consent search and then there was a discretionary consent search. And I even went to, the internet to get a definition of that but could you explain to us uh, that was on page I think it was on page 10 
of the report where it, it, it segregated the data in terms of what a, a search was and a discretionary search. A consent, dis I'm sorry, discretionary consent search. Could you explain that to us, please? Yes, sir. So anybody given uh, consent, whether it's written or, or verbal, has the authority to stop a search at any time and has the authority to limit the search. So, for instance, if I ask you if I have um, or if I can search your vehicle, you, you can tell me as a police officer, yes, you can search my vehicle, but you cannot search this, and I have to abide by that um, statement. Okay, so if, if one of our law enforcement officers sees some cause, reasonable cause to give a search, they still have to request the permission well, from that person? No, sir. Now, if you have probable cause, you do not need consent. Now, there are exceptions to a search warrant, and these exceptions allow an officer to go inside a house or a car to do a search, and some of those are just plain view. Uh, plain view could be simply seeing something in the car while you're up there uh, uh, lawfully uh, dealing with the individual, or if you smell something, or if you hear something for that matter. So there are exceptions to, and consent is one of those exceptions. Okay, and, going, and I know I'm a little off topic in terms of the, the pro, racial profiling report, but going back to that, on, the, on page 10, I, I did note that only 3% of the stops actually resulted in searches. And looking at the data in terms of the, uh, the races of the individuals stopped, it was almost even. It said of the 3% of those searches, whites were 5%, blacks were 4%, Hispanics were 1%. So if you take a look at those particular percentages and say, is anything way out of kilter on a statistical basis, the answer to that is no. And in fact, the, the report itself made very specific identification of that, that there is, I guess you'd have to say, compliance with what is not necessary in understanding in terms of how our law enforcement officers treat individuals uh, regardless of their race. Absolutely. So there, there again, those low, low, low percentages are another commendation to our law enforcement officers to compliance with racial profiling. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, Mr. Contreras. <coughs> yes, uh, um, Assistant Chief Stogner. Walk me through the process that it takes to be part of that 66% that gets warnings. So, what, well, what we want is compliance. And if, if the officer deems that um, giving a verbal warning will um, deter the driver from doing the same act again, then that's what they'll do. It, it's the officer's discretion. So during their training, they're, they're kind of walked through a process where they can evaluate what's going on during the stop and use their own discretion to Absolutely. Uh, yes, sir. make those decisions. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Seeing yes, none, sir. Thank you. Again, a commendation to our law enforcement for this report, which indicates we do have the very best law enforcement in the entire country as far as this guy is concerned. And I think on behalf of our council, we have the very, very best. Thank well, thank you for, you for your leadership that. And to new guy sitting in the back there, Chief Levine. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, folks, as I mentioned, that we did not finish our executive session. So the timestamp we are going to recess, uh, City Council open session, the timestamp is on that is 8:19. And the city council members, if you would please retire to the briefing room, we will continue our executive session in there. Uh, citizens, you're most welcome to stay here until we come back out of executive session and reconvene our open session. I do not have any idea what time that might be. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we are reopening our city council session. Our timestamp on that is 9:18. And seeing as there is no further business, oh, I'm sorry, uh, item 5E is an echo, uh, taking necessary action as a result of executive session. There is no action to be taken on item 5E. With that, uh, the completion of all business of this city council meeting on February the 15th, 2022, with your journey at 919.